Good morning. Good morning. It's good to see most of you. I didn't know whether you catch that or not. It's good to see all of you this morning. In this uh, cold, uh, snowy day outside, it's always warm inside. I'll wait till these folks get their coffee and we'll say a word. Yeah, Dick, I'm looking at you. <laughs> go ahead, Dick, go ahead. I think we can pray why they're getting coffee or not. Father, we just come to you this morning and I pray that we have open hearts and open minds and we are willing to hear your word and willing to chew on it and think about it and, and then believe what you have to tell us this morning. And Father, I thank you for touching each one of us. For at one point in our life, we did not know you. We did not know the goodness of you. But Father, you have come into our lives and you changed us. You have taken us out of the darkness and brought us into the light. And you have taught us the good news. The good news of the kingdom and the good news of Jesus Christ. And what he has done for each one of us. And Father, we just thank you for that hope that Jesus has brought to us. That when we leave this world, we know that we will be in your world. And we will be with you in eternity. Amen. Enjoying life in heaven. What a blessing it is, Lord. And help us to have that hope to share and spread that good news. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God has a good way of working things out. Uh, I needed to say thank you to Tony and Rhonda and also for Nancy because after last Sunday they encouraged me to come back and speak this Sunday. Mm -hmm. And Tony, after the service last week, was gracious enough and said, Hey, I'll give you my spot next week. I think you need to continue. <laughs> and as it worked out, Rhonda being sick over the last three days, we pray for her. Tony not being able to be here. Either Nancy or I, we might not have been <laughs> prepared to, to fill in at the spur of the moment. So uh, hats off to our Heavenly Father. Amen. <laughs> We are going to continue with the theme of the kingdom of God this morning. And we do not have the screen. I didn't have a whole lot to put on the screen regardless. But just real quickly, the four elements that we talked about last week to remind us is talking about the kingdom of God. We learned that the word kingdom means reign or rule or authority in the Greek translation. Uh, we know that God's reign and authority was coming to earth. We know that the kingdom of God is a spiritual kingdom. Jesus himself said, you cannot say here it is or there it is. Jesus also said it was in our midst. It's a spiritual kingdom. It has no boundaries. It's not physical. We also talked about the kingdom being manifested in and through Jesus Christ. And as we read the New Testament, we see how many examples of that kingdom being manifested in through him and the power of God changing somebody's life radically. We also talked about this same power should be manifested through the church. The church being the body of believers. We see God's power manifested in the church, but I want to go on record I guess in saying that we should see more of it. Yes. And we should be more open to it. Mm -hmm. And we also talked about the Kingdom of God is here now. It's in the present. And we also know that it's going to be in the future. When Jesus comes again, He will establish His physical kingdom on earth. There will be a new earth and there will be a new kingdom. <clears throat> That's where we left last Sunday. Now I have to be honest with you. Last Sunday night I went to bed early. I was going to be pulling a, a house down to Oakland, Maryland, and I always like to be rested when I, when I do that. Went to bed about 8 o'clock, I believe, and I laid there and tossed and turned. You think I could go to sleep? And it wasn't my fault. It was God's fault. I told him that, too. But as I laid there, I was thinking about the message that we had in the morning, and I was thinking, boy, where I'm going to go next. And I had a, a, a good plan of where I was going to go uh, my next time I talked, and as I lay there and these thoughts were going through my head, God said, no, I don't want you to do that. And the reason I know it was God talking to me, because it was ideas and thoughts that I had never thought about. 
And I truly believe God talks to each one of us. Most of the time, we don't listen. Most of the time, we're not open to hear that. Our ministry teacher used to tell us that all these thoughts are coming to us all the time, but mostly they go, doink, and they bounce off, which I believe is true. But every once in a while, we are open to what God has to tell us. And he was telling me to go in a different direction today, so I kind of had to start all over this week. And I, I, I also thank him because he guided me through this process. And it was kind of strange because... Where I left off last week was with Mark 1, 14 and 15. And God said, I want you to go right back to that. I didn't know there was anything else to talk about in that verse. <laughs> but apparently there is. And as I've gone through this, God does have some more to say to us through that scripture. So Mark 1, 14 and 15, I'll read it again. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. So the first thing that I went to is what is God telling us here? Or what is Jesus telling us? What is the good news? We know he's talking about the kingdom of God. And learning about the kingdom of God, that is definitely good news. But is there more? Was there more to what Jesus was saying when he was talking about the good news? I think to kind of get into that a little bit, we need to think about who Jesus' audience was when he was speaking. And I, it was a, mainly a Jewish audience. And they would have recognized that word kingdom as reign or power or authority. We talked about that last week. The Jews used that word and it meant that. We also have to remember that this audience, this Jewish audience, they were anticipating a Messiah, weren't they? They had been long taught that there was a Messiah coming. I mean, that was prophesied many times throughout the Old Testament. And as we spoke before also, the Old Testament really points to a Messiah. That points to Jesus. So his audience would have would have understood some of this, I think. But I have to ask myself, when Jesus said those words in that scripture, did the Jewish audience at the time, did they understand the depth of what Jesus was saying? And that's why kind of where we're going to go here this morning. Did they understand the depth of this scripture, what Jesus was telling them in this message? And then I had to ask myself, do I understand? Do we understand? And I was a little hesitant here this morning because where I'm headed with this, I cannot back up with Scripture. And that's a little unnerving because anybody up here wants to be speaking the truth. I don't have a Scripture that speaks directly to what I'm going to be talking about. But we know with any story you read, whether it's in the Bible or whether you're reading a secular story, you can read a paragraph or a chapter and you can build in your own mind maybe some things that are being said that are not really written in the words. We can read between the lines, so to speak. So that's kind of where I'm coming at this morning. That's my little disclaimer. So to understand the message or the meaning of the good news, we really have to go to another word in that scripture first. And that is the word repent. I'm not even going to try to pronounce it in the Greek. I've listened to it I don't know how many times, but I'm not going to even try it. I won't embarrass myself. But if you translate, re translate repent in the Greek, it really means to change one's mind or to change your attitude. To change how you think. Now, the definition that I looked up did not say anything specific. It just said to change your mind or to change your attitude about anything. It wasn't specific to a certain particular thing. But when we hear repent, what do we think of? Sin. 
throughout the whole Bible, when we hear repent, we read repent, we automatically connect it to sin. And I'm not saying that's wrong. We have to think of repentance and sin together. We have to change our minds about sin. When we start our relationship with Jesus Christ, I say, I believe in Jesus Christ. I have faith in Him. God grants us grace. We are saved through faith by grace. That's when the relationship starts. But in order for me to continue and grow in that relationship and to build it, I have to recognize my sinful ways and I have to change my mind or change my attitude about what I am doing that is sinful against our Father. That's the way we continue to build that relationship and grow in that relationship. And also, repentance is important when we are trying to restore that relationship. Because if we have something in our life that we just keep doing and keep doing, that sin builds up a wall between us and our Father. It kind of blocks that relationship. But when I confess it, and I change my mind about it, and I change my attitude, I realize that it is a sin against God, then when I confess it, that repairs, that, tear down, that tears down the wall, and you can mend that relationship. So repentance connected to sin is very important. It's a very basic element that we have to have in our relationship. I had some Old Testament scriptures. I'm not going to take time to read them, but we see repentance all through the Bible, clear back into the Old Testament, basically from the beginning. And a lot of times in the Old Testament, when you read about a person or a nation repenting, you also see a blessing that comes after. God does bless us when we confess our sins and we repent, we change our heart, change our mind about what we're doing. Even if it's a blessing of just coming together again with Him. Repentance is very important. And we see in that scripture in Mark that Jesus starts His message with that word repent. Two things I need you to remember this morning. That verse we talked about is the first message that Jesus was given. It was after John had baptized him. John was already put in prison. Remember that this is the very first message that Jesus gave. And also remember the audience was Jewish. And he started that very message with the word repent. I had to ask her. God put this question in my mind. If this was Jesus' first message at the beginning of His ministry, His audience was Jewish. They were looking for a Messiah. They were anticipating a Messiah. Would the first thing out of Jesus' mouth be about sin? Have you ever thought of it that way? I think... And I believe, yes, Jesus had to speak of sin. Just for the reasons we talked about. Jesus would have had to confront their sinful lifestyles. And the Jews would have had to confront their life, sinful lifestyles. But is this the only thing that Jesus meant by that word repent in His first message, the beginning of His ministry? Every commentary I read, I've read quite a few. I listened to or I read different minister's notes of other people talking about this. Everybody went to repentance. Jesus was talking about repentance. I'm not saying that's wrong. I'm thinking maybe there's another way to think about it also. There seems like there has to be more to it. And I think in order to ask that question, we look at his audience. We look at the Jews who were standing there in front of him listening to this. And I think we have to go and look at their culture. Who were they? What was happening at the time uh, of Jesus, in Jesus' time? And I'm going to admit that I'm not an expert on Jewish culture. I know probably this much. Probably enough to get in trouble. I tried to calculate how many years it was between 
the time that the Ten Commandments were given and the time Jesus was baptized. I think I'm pretty close. I come up with 1,518 years. Other people would say it was over 1,500. So it's in there somewhere. It's a lot of years. 1,500 years. How many generations of that is that? 15? That's a long time. Yeah. That's many generations. <laughs> I'm only using 1,500 as a, as a reference point, really. So here we are, 1,500 years from the time that they received the Ten Commandments until Jesus was baptized. And let's just look back when the Ten Commandments were handed down. What was going on? The Israelites were in the desert, correct? They were at Mount Sinai. That's where they received the Ten Commandments. God gave them to Moses. Moses handed it to the Israelites. But also at that time, they received the Mosaic Law. And I don't know a whole lot about the Mosaic Law, but I'm going to read you a few things. The Mosaic Law was given specifically to, I can't even talk, specifically to the nation of Israel. They were God's chosen people. God said, I will be your God and you will be my people. The Mosaic Law is made up of three parts. The Ten Commandments, which we are probably most familiar with. Also things called the ordinances. Those little things that they had to pay attention to and follow and try to obey. And then they had the worship system, which was the priesthood, the tabernacle, the offerings and sacrifices they made, and all the festivals throughout the year that they had to observe. This is the way they worshipped. This is what they tried to follow. And what was accomplished through the Mosaic Law was it revealed who God was and His character. It set apart the nation of Israel from all other nations. It revealed the sinfulness of man. It provided forgiveness through sacrifice and offerings. It provided a way of worship for the community. And it provides God's direction for the physical and spiritual health of the nation. Now you think about that. For 1,500 years, this is what the Jewish nation, the nation of Israel, this is how they operated. This was their life. This was their spiritual life. This was their culture. This was given to them by God to follow, try to obey, and to do. Have you ever read the book of Exodus and then read into Leviticus? It's a pretty hard read, isn't it? It kind of makes your head explode. Could you imagine having that handed to you and this is what you needed to try to follow. It would have been difficult. It would have been hard. But this is what God gave them and this is what they followed for that many years handed down from generation to generation. This was their way of life. This would have been ingrained in them. This is what they were taught. His father taught him. His father taught him. His father taught him. And another thought to top it off, after all that, and you're trying to follow this, and you're being obedient when you sin, you, you make the sacrifice, you take the bull, the goat, or the six pigeons, and the three doves, and a ephah, a wheat, whatever was demanded of you, and you went and took care of that. But after all of that, you still cannot have a personal relationship with God. The veil was still in the tabernacle. The separation was still there. God was on one side in the Holy of Holies and the other side was man. You could not go into the presence of God. They even believed if you would go into the presence of God, you would die. So pretty sure you wouldn't go in there. So after doing all of that and following these things that God had given them, they still could not accomplish that personal one-on-one -on -one relationship that you and I are blessed with. But we also know the rest of the story that at the Jesus' death on the cross, the, the curtain in the temple was tore from top to bottom. We know that that way was opened up 
by Jesus Christ so we can have that, that personal relationship with our Heavenly Father. So think about the Jewish audience standing there and Jesus is talking and he's giving this message of the good news of the kingdom of God. How hard would it have been to hear what he was saying? How hard would it be to accept the message that Jesus was going to bring? We know the rest of the story. We know what happened over the next three years of Jesus' ministry. But here he is. He's just starting out. He's talking to the Jews. The Jews who have this ingrained in them, the sacrificial mosaic wall type of worship. Now Jesus comes along with a new message and he's going to turn everything upside down. How hard would it be for the Jews to accept this? I think it would have been terribly hard. And we know a lot didn't. But when Jesus says repent, I think Jesus knew. He understood how hard it was going to be for these people that was listening to him to believe and, and accept this message that he was bringing. He knew that over the next three years, it was going to take a lot to convince these people that what he said was true and it was coming from God and this is the kingdom, this is the good news. I think Jesus knew how hard it was going to be. He knew his people well. And I think God knew it too. God had to know. God knew his people well because he was with them from the beginning and he seen how many times they screwed up, how many times they were disobedient, how many times they were hard headed and selfish. He knew his people well. So I think he also knew that he had to send somebody before Jesus arrived. To put this message out there. And who was that? John the Baptist. John was sent to prepare the people for the coming of the Messiah. Actually, John was anointed for that very purpose by God. I'm not going to get into the story, but John's mother, Elizabeth, was barren. She could not have a child. But because of the grace of God... He made it so she could become pregnant. She became pregnant with John. John's purpose was to be born and to be a humble man and a great man of God. And he was born to prepare the way for Jesus. Jesus himself said John was the greatest among men. So God knew how hard-headed his people were. He knew that they were going to have a hard time accepting this message, the good news of the kingdom. So he sent John. And John said the same thing. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Was John only speaking about sin? Knowing that the people were going to have a hard time with this, I was thinking that John said, repent, yes, maybe speaking of sin, but I think he was also saying, there's something new coming. There's good news coming. The Messiah is coming. You need to change the way you think. I need you to change your attitude, not only about sin, but about your life, about your worship, about who, who God is. I need you to pay attention. I need you to think outside of the box. Because what's coming is totally different than what you're used to. Change your mind. You're going to have to change how you think. Because if you don't, you're not going to receive the good news. You're not going to receive the message. And you're going to miss it. You're going to have to be willing to put the old things away and accept the new. Sound familiar with anybody in here? Do we ever see that in the church? Hmm. How did Jesus start off his first message? Speaking to his Jewish audience. Repent. For the kingdom of God is at hand. Jesus also knew his people. He knew that there was 1,500 plus years ingrained in these people of sacrifice, of being obedient, following the law. This is how they lived. This is how they worshipped. This is what they handed down from generation to generation to generation. They were going to be 
struggling to accept this new way. So when Jesus said repent, was he totally talking about sin? I don't think so. Yes, sin had to be in there. But Jesus was also saying, here I am. The power of God is before you. I need you to change your attitude. I need you to change your mind. I need you to listen. I need you to watch. Pay attention to what I'm saying to you. Change your mind. Be willing to be open. Look at things from a new perspective. Hear what I'm going to say. Soak it in. Chew on it. Think outside the box, however you want to say it. Because the good news is here. It's standing before you, in me, in the Messiah. I want you to believe. I need you to believe. I need you to change your mind so you can come to that point and you can believe in me. That you can believe in the good news of the kingdom. When Jesus was telling them, I have something new for you. They didn't know the Father personally for 1,500 plus years. Jesus is saying, pay attention because I'm going to show you who the Father is. I'm going to show you His character. I'm going to show you His personality. I'm going to show you His love. I'm going to show you His grace. Not only that, you are going to see it in the physical how many people saw the miracles that Jesus did? He is saying, repent. I want you to change your mind because the news, good news is here. And I'm going to show it to you. But if you aren't willing to change your mind, if you're not willing to be open to it, you're going to miss it. You're not going to receive the good news. You're going to be left behind. There was probably a lot of Jews that were left behind. They didn't get it. They couldn't accept it. They couldn't get past 1,500 years of customs and rituals and traditions. I think when he said repent, he wasn't speaking directly to sin. Yes, I had, he, had to, he had to deal with sin. But I think Jesus was also saying, hey, it's here. If you don't change your mind, if you aren't willing to repent and change your attitude, change how you think, see it from a different perspective, be willing to have your eyes opened, then you're going to miss the good news of the kingdom of God. I can't imagine how hard it would have been for the Jews of that day to listen to Jesus throughout His ministry and change their heart and change their mind. How hard is it for us? Tanya and I have talked about this numerous times through her year. She was involved with the UCC since she was a little child. I was brought up in the Brethren Church probably most of our life with a few years in the middle that we wandered off. But we believed what we were told. From, from little up, Sunday school lessons, what we were taught by people in the church, what our mom and dad taught us, what the preacher taught us Sunday morning. That's, that's what we believed. That's where I was taught. And heaven forbid anybody tell me something different because that wasn't right. I never heard that. What I believe is what I believe and it's right and you're wrong. For many, many years we were closed-minded to anything new. If it went against what we were taught in church from little up, it couldn't be right. I was I was a Jew of 1500 years. <laughs> you know, how how unwilling was I to see something different or to change my mind about something? I was part of the UCC church for 31 years. I was on the consistory board for probably 25 of those years. I've seen this firsthand. Denominational churches may be the worst, and I'm not putting anybody down, but it's the way we do things is right. The way we believe is right. The customs that we do is right. We can't accept what you do. 
here again, I'm not putting anybody down, but I, I've seen it between churches in Bedford. The ministers couldn't get along because they couldn't agree how to do things. How sad is that? What are we missing? Because we were closed-minded. I've seen people in the church get angry with each other because they didn't want to put the, dec the decorations in a new place for Christmas. We have to hang them where we hang them. We've done it that way for years. We can't change now. What's the most famous saying in church? We've never done it that way. Are we willing to believe something new? Are we willing to look at things from a new perspective? Can we be open-minded to what God has to show us? Are we listening? Are we willing to repent? I'm willing to change my mind. I'm willing to see something new. Probably up until 10 years ago, if someone would have come up and said about miracles today or the work of the Holy Spirit today, healings, miraculous healings, God working in this way to change things in the physical, I wouldn't have paid attention to them. Jesus freaks. That's what they would have been to me. We had a speaker at our church numerous years ago, and boy, it brought up a lot of conversation. But in the end, I didn't believe what he was saying. I couldn't see it. I wasn't open to it. I didn't know. Along with that, how many churches are not teaching these type of things? You're not being told these type of things. Probably through my 50 years ago in the church, well, 40 up until 10 years ago, I didn't learn anything about the power of the kingdom of God. I wasn't being taught that. But thank God, about 10 years ago, He opened our eyes and He started to introduce us to these things. And I think God had to let us go through some difficulties in our life so our eyes could be opened, that we were ready to see something new. He put people in our lives and started to tell us these things. And we were seeing these things and we were hearing testimony to these things which started to change our mind, to change our thoughts. We were able to see things from a different perspective. And that kind of leads me into the next thing. When we're talking about the power of, of the kingdom of God, we're talking about the kingdom of God coming near. And the part that I think we get hung up on is when that power is being manifested through the church. We get hung up on that. We're, we have a hard time being open to that, that when Jesus said, yes, I want you to go and do what I was doing. Preach the good news. Cast out demons. Heal the sick. And raise the dead. How, how many of us have a hard time with that? I'll admit it. I'm a lot further along than I used to be, but I still can't quite get there. The people at that time, I think, would have had a hard time with it too, but what convinced many? Seeing that person heal, seeing that blind man see, seeing that lame man walk, seeing the leopards heal, seeing somebody raised from the dead, that convinced them this is the power of God. Jesus wants us to do the same thing. But we have to be willing to repent and think about it and see it from a different perspective. To open our eyes, to be willing to believe, to be willing to change, to be willing to be open-minded, to think outside of the box, to try something new. We've never done it that way. I can't do that. We get hung up. So the message I think God was telling me for today is when it comes to understanding the power and the kingdom of God, we have to be open-minded to it and receive it all. One last thought. 
I might get in trouble again. <laughs> when we go out and Jesus tells us to preach the good news, what do we preach? We preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, right? We will tell somebody about his life, his death, his resurrection, and the fact that through all that we are granted salvation, we can go to heaven when we leave this world. That's the gospel in a nutshell. Did Jesus preach that gospel? Jesus said, I came to proclaim the gospel of the kingdom of God. Salvation, yes, is a part of it. Part of the good news is salvation. But Jesus didn't really preach that gospel. He preached the gospel of the kingdom of God. He preached the fact that it was authority. His reign. His power. His rule. He was preaching that God's power was coming through him and it was manifested into him and that spiritual world can change the physical world. We saw it in his ministry. I think we, we preach the gospel, which is great, and we have to do that. We're, we're missing part. We're missing part. We also need to preach the power of the kingdom of God. And I think it would be easier for me to tell somebody about the the kingdom of God versus salvation. And I don't know why that is. Jesus was saying to these Jews, I'm going to show you my Father. I think I'm going to start saying, I want to show you my Father. I want to show you His power, His love. Let me tell you about His grace. Let me tell you who He is. Here's His character, His personality. For me, in thinking of this, I think it's easier to preach that gospel and end with salvation than starting with salvation. Amen. Amen. I told God last Sunday night, I said, you got to quit this. i got to go to sleep. <laughs> I said, I can't remember all this. I need to write this down. Because I'm sure I've missed some of it. But we need to understand what Jesus was saying with the kingdom of God. I think we have a grasp on that. But let's open our minds this morning. Let's look at things from a different perspective. Amen. Let's see what not only this church, but the church worldwide can do when we believe in the kingdom and we believe the good news and we be obedient to that commission that Jesus gave us and said, you go do what I was doing. Thank you, Lord, and amen. <laughs> we have a song now between communion and after communion. Now, may I say two things? Is I've read in several commentaries too. Jesus always preached the kingdom of God more than he did salvation. And I think when we try salvation first, we're trying to get them to understand Jesus. Well, how can you understand him if you don't know about the kingdom from where he came and to know his father? So true. Amen. You do need to repent. Yeah. Repent and have a new mindset. Amen. I love it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Jesus didn't start with salvation. They, they would have never understood that. No. He started, let me, let me show you who my father is. That's a good point. Yeah. We're going to have communion this morning. Luke 22, 14 says, When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table. And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. We know the Passover meal was observed in association with the Jews being freed from Israel. They painted the blood of the lamb across the top of their doors. And when the spirit went through the town, whatever door had blood painted on it, it would pass over. And those people inside would not perish. This equates to the same thing that Jesus has done on the cross for us. By shedding his blood on the cross for us, we are freed from the death that sin causes. 
By His blood we are saved. When they were sitting around the table, Jesus took the loaf of bread and He raised it up and He gave thanks to His Father. And then He said, This bread is My body. And he, as He tore it in two, He said, It is broken for you. Take and eat. And as often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. When they had finished eating, Jesus took the cup of wine and he raised it up again and he, he gave thanks to his Father and he said, this is my blood that is shed for you. Take and drink. And as often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. Let's pray. Father, we just want to take a moment. Sit here in silence as the as the music plays in the background, we just want to think of you. We just want to be in your presence, Lord. Father, we just give you the glory. We give you the honor. We lift up your name. We we praise your name and we worship you. For you are our God and we are your people. And we thank you for that great gift of Jesus Christ, Lord. And the great message that he has brought to us. The message of the kingdom. Help us to be open and to repent and believe the good news. Help us to be open to new ideas, to see Scripture in a different way, to be willing to hear your voice when you want to reveal something new to us. Help us not to be complacent in our relationship with you, thinking that I, I know enough, because we will never know everything about you. So Father, I pray this morning that you will continue to grow us and build us and Open our eyes to who you are and what you have for us with understanding and discernment. And Father, also give us the power to take that and tell others. To reveal you to others and tell them who you are and the depth of your love and your personality and your character and your grace and your power and your authority in your awesomeness. Empower us, Lord, to change our minds, to think outside of the box, to accept something new. And we thank you also, Father, that today we celebrate and commemorate Jesus' death on the cross. Let us never forget what that has done for us. that we will see you when we leave this world. What a hope it is. Father, guide us as we go through this week. Bring us back again next week safely. Reveal to us the ministry opportunities that you put forth. And let us step out of the box and shout to the mountaintops who our God is. In this I pray in your holy name. Go and have a good week. Page 460 in the middle.